class right to the your classmates here also right in class and to all of you here uh, we will be beginning the poem the first poem that uh, has been prescribed for us today i'll just discuss the first five lines of the poem today i'll screen it also so you need not worry about that but before that yesterday or in the previous class we were discussing some of the features of or strategies in post colonial languages right? uh, we saw interlanguage we saw glossing we saw code switching we saw uh, you know structural idiosyncrasies we saw appropriation we saw abrogation a whole lot of these terms that connect with the post colonial linguistic scenario how language forms the intersection of right where power and identity meet up bacon gives us a beautiful premise we all know that what is that knowledge is power knowledge is power bacon's the baconian view of knowledge gain knowledge because knowledge is power power liberates but post colonial studies takes a lot of clues and cues from michel foucault edward said and says power is knowledge how so how is it possible that power is knowledge it happens when you have power you can fix knowledge for example the government of india or the government of tamil nadu or the government of the united states of america they have power and they fix knowledge for you and for me right? so power is knowledge says post colonial studies so we should be very careful about how power operates even through the texts that are disseminated in the previous class we were discussing something on raymond williams three terms about the dominant cultures the residual cultures and the emergent cultures there are voices waiting to come up and how do we celebrate them seeing through the nexus this is one the the linguistic component secondly uh, we will talk about the no um, the glossing the code switching uh, sometimes you know interlanguage we call it they'll be talking in english suddenly there will be a code switching and they will use you know what is called interlanguage interference again liberated we also discussed chinu achibis views on using the english language vis a vis uh, gugi watyango's views on the english language right we discussed george orwell's views on the english language nature downwards we saw about a whole lot of these philosophers and their views on language the linguistic turn we saw that in the 20th century onward now why does post colonial studies give a lot of emphasis on language because language conditions are reality and reality uh, nisha says no right language conditions the reality and as many languages are there as many realities are there and reality gives us a truth so as many reality realities are there as many truths are there so where is truth again bacon asks you know in that beautiful essay of truth where is truth what is truth we'll be discussing some of those components today and please as i said earlier choose something that doesn't merely entertain but empowers you and me and we in general i read a writer uh, thanks to katha they came up with a you know oxford book of short stories if i'm right right years back i was able to get introduced to a lot of writers one particular short story writer that was new to me i always go by these uncelebrated writers and this is by you know at least for me she is new right maybe for people in kerala she is some somebody who has been uh, very popular there um she was a professor of all saints college uh, trivandrum yes i'm not sure right chandrika b right her name is the story of a poem that's the title of the short story the story of a poem 
and please remember this also post colonial poetry doesn't have the beautiful western template i wanted low only as a cloud that floats high over wales and else oh what a, oh what can ail the night at arms no you won't find a merriment there you find a victimhood there the pain the angst so don't expect the pentameter there in poetry because the pentameter restricts it doesn't liberate it disempowers says edward kamau brathwaite isn't it the hurricane doesn't roar in pentameters he says so there is a writer uh, chandrika b there is also another chandrika um, i think uh, she is uh, relatively new again from kerala but she is relatively new chandrika b has written a short story called the story of a poem where a, the protagonist there is a typical housewife and she loves writing poetry she loves writing poetry but unfortunately she is a housewife and so she has to take care of her husband right from morning rangoli till night bedtime doing the bed and putting the children to sleep she has a whole lot of household chores on her drudgery that she is not able to find time to write a poem so whenever inspiration peaks on her she goes and writes a poem so she has a paper with her on the dining table on the dining table now after her husband goes to work and the children go to school she goes for a bath when she is taking the shower suddenly a few lines of inspiration come upon her and she immediately rushes towards the dining table where she has a blank paper like this and with a pen on her dripping all wet and all naked dripping wet she starts writing down those lines right that come to her spontaneously you know poetry is spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings this it? it takes its origin from emotions recollected in tranquility so spontaneously she writes them down and again after some time when she is doing the cooking the cutlery she finds another beautiful line passing her by she gets so inspired she rushes again to the dining table takes out a pen and then she starts writing them down and by the end of the day right when she is almost done with the poem that is when she hears a knock at the door and she finds her husband is back and her children are about to be back the moment she hears a knock at the door you know what she does she immediately goes to the table takes up the paper that is in her hand whatever she has beautifully written down i i hope most of you must have known the story i was so inspired that i you know i am the convener of the syllabus revision committee i wanted to i wanted it to be prescribed in the new syllabus it is there you know what she does she has written down a poem out of pure inspiration now since she hears a knock at the door her husband is back she rushes to the dining table and immediately tears or shreds it into bits she tears the you know the sheet into bits and bits completely into bits and bits and you know what she puts it in the dustbin right she puts it in the dustbin now the author says in the last line if at all you want to know her story you must piece these bits together if at all you want to know her story you should piece you know put back these pieces together all these you know uh, bits and pieces together to get her version of her story which has been conveniently put into the dust my dear students this is exactly what post colonial poetry is all about there is a pain there are voices that are oppressed that are suppressed that need to be liberated the need to be voiced that need to come out and here you know uh, i'll just give you another example from emmy jones right? a journalist who was out there to interview jennifer aniston you all must have known this popular interview it is there out in ted talks please listen to that i was literally crying when i was listening to this ted talk 
on um, YouTube. It's there. Please listen to it. It's around 15 to 16 minutes. She's a journalist who was out there asked to interview Jennifer Aniston, that celebrated right, uh, actor. What was the occasion? Here was a female actor who was turning 40. Turning 40 for a female actor and this long and innings in the uh, cinema industry was supposed to be something great, it seems. So she was asked to interview her with some cliched stereotype questions. What were they? She, uh, she was taught to ask, what does it feel to be a woman at 40 without Brad Pitt? Without a male companion, what does it mean to be a woman at 40? See how crude a question you could ever ask somebody. How inhuman you should be. Right? Now I'm talking about the politics of the entertainment industry that Amy Jones is trying to bring out. Hats off to her. She says, ask her this question. You now what's this question? How does it feel to be a woman at 40 without Brad Pitt or without a male companion? You are 40. And ironically, her male and the lead hero in the same movie that she had acted just then had also turned 40 the same time. But no media was bothered about that because even in India, we find even at 60 or 70, still the male acts a hero who dotes or goes after a girl who is just in room Padanara or in room right? Ever As if they are evergreen heroes. We have seen that. No harm or offense meant to anyone, but still, you know, these polarities in gender constructions, something that was disheartening for Jennifer Aniston. Second thing they asked her was her body. How do you think you will maintain your beauty and your body after 40? What does it feel to be a woman without a baby at 40? See how cruel questions that were asked just a couple of years ago to a celebrated woman actor in town. And how these stereotypical jaundiced mindsets have had the audacity or the guts to speak only about the age, the body and the beauty of a woman. As if that was all that mattered for a woman. And this journalist says, had they asked me to ask something about her work, I would have been happy. They didn't bother to ask anything about how she loves her work, her profession. But they were very concerned about her age, her beauty, her body, whether she had a baby. As if a person's ultimate goal in life were to fall in love, marry somebody and get a baby for that person. The gaze, right? the gaze, the, the topic again, no? in TED Talks you can key in female gaze. Right? The toxic female gaze, that's how the TED talk talks, uh, starts. The toxic female gaze. How we are conditioned. My question to you today is some critical thinking for us, dear students. Why do you think people ask such silly, stupid questions? You know, I have seen pastors, Christian pastors doing this in households. When a woman who is almost nearing 25 or 26 is not married and still in the house, I have seen pastors blatantly violating their restrictions, their limits. You know what they do? They look at the girl. And you know what they say? Don't be worried, my dear Mole, my dear kid, my dear girl. Don't Don't be worried. Very soon you will get a beautiful, a handsome prince, charming. Don't, as if the girl is crying. And when they pray also, oh Lord, with all the shalabala that comes along, you know, they'll pray. Oh Lord, God of, please descend on this girl for all the sins that she has committed. Forgive her. Pardon her. Maybe she has committed some crimes. Pardon her. That's why she's not married. As if someone asked him to pray for her, as if wedding or being married is the ultimate goal in a person's life. And after you are married also. Right? Oh Lord, 
make sure that this girl has a kid she has not been having a kid for long we don't know who committed the sin please open the doors of heaven and make sure that she gets a kid as if she was crying all the way for she is celebrating her life in her own terms what audacity you have to ask her about that or ask any person about that why do you think this bio power you know um, this is what pastoral power that initial fuko talks about i'm not critical about you know individuals as such but i'm talking about the broad malady that has infested society to ask people like this don't worry as if she is crying as if he is crying will the pastor ever pray oh lord make sure that the elderly gentleman in this house will die soon the elderly lady in this house when are you going to die will you ask that she won't or she won't these biased mindsets why do you think they are there in society you know we started off in the first few classes with these stereotypes why do you think these biased mindsets are there in society do you think something can be done about that i have a good answer but before i give my answer i also want to celebrate other equally relevant and vital answers if you have any clue on that or a cue on that you could always unmute yourself and answer give me a suggestion or you know let's open a discussion on that why do you think these so called even you know professors do that i'm sorry to say that when an unmarried male colleague is there in the department not in mcc mcc you know we have some tolerance i have seen in other colleges institutions when an unmarried woman is there in the department hey paavum this girl make sure she gets a good husband ah paavum this boy he is suffering alone get her a good get him a good wife da right before her right before stick to his face stupid stereotypical mindsets post colonial studies looks at all the hurt these stereotypes these stigmas these silences have caused to a human being the gaze how it affects identity agency and how can i fight back is are there any uh, ideas that you have when you think about these stereotypes how do you think we can change these prejudiced mindsets be it a pastor or be it a class master or whoever it is or she is or he is how do you think that can be a sea change that's one reason why my dear students we tell you to work on areas that matter that should you know in 1963 28 august when martin luther gave a speech on the color politics in society you know what he said i have a dream that one day my four little black children will walk hand in hand in the white children down the streets of alabama mississippi and one more sentence he said one day will come when my children will be judged not by the color of their skin but by the content of their character one day he had a dream he had a dream we have you know a whole 1903 so oh, what is that uh, uh, web du bois d u b o i s 1903 is famous book where he talks about the whale you know v e i l the whale that every african american has to it's an invisible whale he calls it double consciousness a term coined by uh dieu bois double consciousness what is double consciousness the consciousness of me looking at me and the consciousness of a superior white race looking at me like double consciousness so i have to be conscious not only of my own inherent lackness something that lack that's lacking in me 
at the same time i'll also to be very conscious about how the whites or my superiors look at me the gays why do you think i can give you uh, uh, i am not exaggerating i can give you 2000 rupees right 2000 rupees as immediate cash price if you can think an answer how do you think we can try taking the first baby step towards eradicating the stereotypes i did this in my classes i'm not joking a second in same post colonial studies class there was a girl in this class you know i had openly challenged the class is there anybody in this class who can write down i gave them a chalk quiz we were in cellular hall back then right? i gave them a chalk quiz asked them straight to the board and said if there is anyone here who can write at least 25 regional writers it could be from kerala tamil nadu andhra karnataka up mp assam and the man wherever 25 regional writers just two hands rose from the class one is uh, this girl who i'm talking about her name is salina hasma she is now a famous news reader in kalanjar tv i'm so happy to say that and another is a girl from kerala i forgot her name because she wrote 12 salina wrote 25 26 27 28 29 i was surprised sir i can write uh, more i had promised 1000 rupees if anyone could write 25 regional writers the way our minds are conditioned my dear students with shakespeare and milton as the canonical writers that we completely forget the mullaipoo the uh, the mallipoo in my own backyard she wrote almost 30 i said stop salina i promised you 1000 i'm doubling the amount i gave her a cash price of 2000 rupees now this is not about the money this is about how you can transform your sensibility and transform the perspectives of people around us how do you think these stereotypes can be eradicated from society is it possible i would say it is possible there is a proverb in tamil that says adi mel adi vaithal ammiyum nagarum isn't it right adi mel adi vaithal ammiyum nagarum so single step for humans a giant leap for man can how do you do it i want you to think about it let our classes be transformational classes that are going to make a difference to scores and scores of people in society let's not just do a poem write it down in an essay and leave it after that you and i and we are given the divine responsibility or the humane responsibility let's forget the divine of transforming the perspectives of people the hurt that has infected people 16 to 24 age group girls in britain in uk you know a study ted talk uh, she says amy jones says they find themselves you know the word is worthless worthless of no value and they say it is because of the stereotypes that are generated in society how many uh, frocks for young little girls the toddlers are in blue or green and how many flower how many frocks are there in pink how many dolls that you find in the doll stores all over india in pink why is size 0 the famous size for us why is barbie doll celebrated venerated why is the song barbie doll very famous why do our girls still dance to barbie doll song how stereotypes infiltrate society you know a survey says a majority 75% and above of girls between the age group of 16 and 24 found themselves worthless in your united states anorexia you know what is anorexia right anorexia means how many you know anorexia means an excessive obsession with being lean i should not put on weight i read a story i forgot uh, the name of the writer about a little uh, about a young actress a female actor 
who used to go to the gym every day in and day out why because she didn't want to put on weight she wanted to maintain a body structure why does she want to maintain a body structure only then people will look at her admire her gaze at her so what happened was in a particular period of time she wanted to indulge herself in food she wanted to indulge herself in food she indulged herself in food put on a lot of weight the next month you know what happened in the newspapers is dash pregnant did she marry secretly just because she put on some weight rumor mills are working over time that she is the same thing that barack obama talks about in his dreams from a father you should read this memoir where he says just because he was black he was asked a whole lot of questions oh you look handsome still you look karupa irundalo they say no although you are dark you are why that although they asked him do you play basketball like they asked tall girls no do you play basketball the first question they asked him he says you know the pain some of the incidents you know he mentions there in his memoir so disheartening when he goes to his own town in kenya to a restaurant to have food he finds he was waiting along with his sister for the food he was waiting for 15 minutes when some white foreigners they also landed in the restaurant and the waiter immediately went on to them his sister was hungry so she ordered some food for him the waiter immediately went on to the white foreigners and he started taking the you know uh, the list from them and he started catering to them completely ignoring or forgetting the fact that here was a human being with his own sister waiting for the food sister grew, grew so impatient and angry you know what she did she took all the money she had in her purse and threw it at the counter and said we blacks are also you know in a, in a typical inevitable style she said we blacks we also have self esteem we also have money on us this humiliation that happens in society how are these stereotypes circulated and what can be done to control or contain these stereotypes how do you do that you can think about it in the meantime i'll give you this poem uh, for today this is uh, uh, what's that uh, two cultures by david abedin right so uh, i'm just putting it out for you i hope it's visible there for those of you uh, uh, here in class right i'll just read it out don't worry here how a boy a thak look at that b a a i means b o y see how language becomes a liberator strategy please remember also this language is the primary means through which you establish your identity we have been seeing this thus long 1828 when noah webster came out with his dictionary the first thing he did was i am going to simplify the language language could also always become a means of protest in 1776 when america declared its independence the first thing that they did was to dispense with every language scenario that connects with the britishers so you use the word tram car you use the word train we use the word tram car you use the word post we will use the word mail you use the word police we will use the word cop you use the word chocolates we use the word candy bar you use the word garbage we use the word trash you use you know first floor for you ground floor for us west is inner garment for you west is outer garment for us so language becomes a vital tool of protest also when i deviate from the standard language you now one reason why we celebrate our regional varieties of english is because it liberates the same with caribbean creole they use this this way b a i and see the way you know talk t a a k when it should be l but david abin says don't you ever dare ask me to write in your english 
you have given me an english yes but i this is writing back take it back this is writing back and when i write back when i look back that's the third line you have no look he says now you'll understand the term look from a very enhanced perspective isn't it because look here right is returning the gaze returning the gaze i'll give you a very small example a housewife has been tortured tormented for a whole lot of time right from the time the, the the man gets up in the morning hey do this for me give me my coffee do the bed give me my upma give me my chutney give me my this give me my that okay okay ayya okay ayya okay ayya. she been doing it one fine day came evening she asked her what are you doing i am watching television bring me my coffee you know what she said for the first time she replied go and get your coffee you are surprised what's this go go get my coffee then she said if i don't get you your coffee what will you do you know what he said he couldn't withstand that question he immediately he wilted and he said i will make my coffee and he rushed when the gaze is returned they will become paspam they will be demoralized they will not know what to do when the gaze is returned post colonial studies look at the word look now for the first time he feels empowered that he is returning the gaze writing back becomes a strategy looking back becomes a strategy right empire writes back the famous book 1989 by bill ashcroft et al here how a boy a talk what like bbc see the comparison no like bbc because when i speak like the bbc i imbibe a power structure i acknowledge the superiority of the britishers hegemony i also acknowledge that bbc listening to bbc is listening to truth vellai tholana poi solladu a white skin will not lie i think 1950 did not black skin white mass you should read gauri vishwanathan's beautiful work text she was an mcc 10 years back for an endowment lecture we invited her she was gracious enough to come you know one of uh, a pioneer in post colonial studies the mass of conquest she has written please read it the mass of conquest writing back becomes a strategy in my own english that's why we celebrate english yes like bbc when i try to imitate the bbc version of english when i try to speak like them walk like them talk like them see the words he uses no here how a boy talk like them then walk like them all the mannerisms have changed like bbc why has it changed because bbc english is being constantly broadcast all over caribbean islands and the boy is listening to bbc english the more he listens to that language his identity gets transformed into that language right the more he listens to bbc the more he feels alienated from his own culture that's why two cultures the topic the title of the book this is called ambivalence homi baba uses the term ambivalence right another word double bind ambivalence means two valences right ambivalence means right two double bind is used by gayatri spivak again right i want this 
I don't want this. Pudikyo, ana pudikya adu. That is ambivalence. I love it. At the same time, I resist it. I love the English language, but at the same time, I hate the English language. Right? This duality is called ambivalence. Right? The Americans don't have it. The Britishers don't have it. Why? Because they didn't have this bilingual problem at all. They weren't colonized the way we were colonized. So they don't have this ambivalence. So ambivalence becomes a strategy. Writing back one beautiful poem. You know, you should read the, you should read and listen to these songs. I can't play them because of copyright uh, restrictions. There are songs, reggae and calypso. Please, uh, when we had direct classes, real time classes, I used to play them. I used to have speakers and I used to play every other year. We used to do that. Make the students listen to these post-colonial songs, especially um, waltzing Matilda or a brown girl in the ring or buffalo soldier stolen from Africa, brought to America. We sing the song as if it's a very happy, peppy number, right? Buffalo soldier stolen from Africa, brought to America. And we all know this number, but there is a huge pain within every word and every line of this poem. The same with the brown girl, the same with by the rivers of Babylon. Do you find any happiness there? It's full of hurt, not happiness. Passing from hurt to happiness lies the crux of post-colonial studies. By the rivers of Babylon that we sat down, a we wept when we remembered Zion. Why? Zion is the land of freedom for me. I am in captivity here. So whenever I'm reminded of Zion, I'm so happy. Country roads take me home to the place where I belong. Country roads take me to the place where I belong. This is not my home. Please remember, home is a place where you belong. They don't belong there. In, uh, 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 who is that? Uh, Salman Rushdie's beautiful uh, book, Imaginary Homelands. He gives a very intense line. What does it mean to be an Indian outside of India? What does it mean, I repeat, to be an Indian outside of India? A line filled with pain and anguish, isn't it? Just imagine you and I, we are all in a faraway country in Antarctica or you know, in America now. But we feel at home only in India, right? Just imagine we are all in America, across the Atlantic. Now, what will be your impressions on my motherland? Isn't it? Have you ever thought about that? What will be your impressions on your motherland from this far place? How will you look at your India? You cannot describe it. You cannot describe it, isn't it? What does it mean to be an Indian outside India? The concept of home in post-colonial studies. Because you know you have two words here, place and space, right? Post-colonial studies talks about spaces, right? A whole lot of terms are there. Bhakti has come up with terms like heterotopias, you know, spaces, spaces. What is it? space and what is a place? Please remember these words: space and place. Right. These are things that you should please don't forget for life. Place is where you have security. Space is where you have freedom. See the beautiful difference, you know. Place is where you have security. So this is a place. Right? Imagine this is a place. We have freedom to an extent. Right? After this class is over, uh, the kids, the students will be free. I will be free. But still we have freedom here, right? No one is oppressive. No one is suppressing anybody else. No, we have, yes. Place is security. It gives security. There is a security outside standing. 
right? So nothing harmful will happen to any of the kids, you know, in campus. But space is freedom, liberation. How beautiful! Post-colonial spaces is where we breathe freedom through our language. Understood? Right? We breathe freedom. How? Through language. I've always cited this beautiful example of uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Langston Hughes. Right? Paul Lawrence Dunbar, in a sympathy, he talks about the cage bird that sings. Although it is in a cage, although the bird is in a cage, but still the bird sings a song. Right? It's although it is in a cage, although the bird is in a cage, still she sings a song. What a beautiful image, no? Although she feels she is in a cage, she still sings her song because if she doesn't sing her song, who else will sing her song? If she doesn't sing her pain, who else will sing her pain? If she doesn't speak her anguish, who is, who is going to speak her anguish? So here, the moment I imbibe another culture and their language, my identity is transformed. Vaka in Untouchable by Mulkra Janan. Um, um, you know, Mulkra Janan's uh, Vaka, that little boy, who is enamored by all things foreign. Why is that? Because he feels he's incomplete in his own culture. Why is that? Because he had a craze for the English language. He was so enamored and enticed by the English language that he looks down on his own people. The same happens here. Look how a boy a talk. Look how a boy a walk. Like what? The next one. Like a white man. White. First like BBC. Then you imitate them. The people, first you imitate their language, then you imitate their culture, their ways of life. Cork hat upon the head, right? The word C A A K, no? C, they have written it as C A A K. Cork. Cork means C O R K, right? Cork hats. The cork hat was always associated with power. That is why even today in the United States, when they sing their national anthem, they are not supposed to have the hat on their head. Because uh, even at uh, when a person dies or passes away, especially reputed people, or even in general, no, even in our land, I think we have this culture of removing their hats or their cap. Isn't it? Right? We have seen that. Why is that as a mark of respect? Because cap is always connected with power, that imperial power. Especially the cork hat that they wear, the colonizers, the colonizing masters wore, was always see symbolic, right? The symbols that we find here: cork hat upon the head and wristwatch upon the hand. See the way it's written, no? Pun, pun, he, ha. Can you ever think it is a sentence, right? P U N, he, ha. See the way. You know, this is the poly dialectical culture of the Caribbean. Poly dialectical. Poly dialect. Upon the hand. Upon the hand. These are the five lines for today. We'll stop here. And yesterday, you know, as I promised you, I've given a list of the first seven, right? Who will have to uh, give something new, like, you know, Chandrika B that I said today, no? Any new writer, please bring them to the forefront. Let's celebrate them. You won't know one word by you, one suggestion by you can change perspectives for the better. Write. Publish poems. I'm so happy that some of you are doing it. Hats off to you guys. Publish. Make your voice known and heard. Whenever you find the time. In social media. I'm not in any of the social media. Right? Uh, I'm only on WhatsApp, so I do it on WhatsApp. Wherever you find the time, whenever you find the time, 
try to empower celebrate yourself also and uh this saturday morning 8:30 sharp i think we are eagerly waiting for you guys we can have just one or two powerpoints because you know sometimes the photo the photograph and one or two lines because we might not have been initiated to them and i want to record it also for posterity so that others will get some inspiration we will make unknown voices unheard voices come out and let's celebrate them together it's heard melodies are sweet keep says no unheard are sweeter yes thank you so much we'll stop there for now if there are any suggestions or questions or doubts or you may unmute and ask me else uh we'll wind up here have a good day thank you sir thank you.